Okay. And everybody, this is uh, Jeff D., who is with uh, Cave Master. Um, would you be able to fill in our audience in regards to uh, what work you've done with Cave Master, any work you've done previously? Uh, yeah, well, I got my start in the paper games industry as an, uh, well, I, uh, actually as co-designer of Villains and Vigilantes in 1979, which was the, uh, folks call it the first complete superhero role-playing game. Uh, it's actually predated by a game called Superhero 2044, which didn't actually include any rules for how powers worked. Um, and then I went into the uh, the uh, into uh, TSR as a staff artist, um, and I can show off if I of my video. There's the module Tomb of Horrors, a later edition with uh, cover painting by me. Oh. And I did a bunch of interiors and stuff. Uh, that's what is that? It's, um, eighty-one. Um, I've been uh, right, uh, lately. I've I'm well known for a series of Kickstarter projects where I'm recreating the artwork that I did at TSR because uh, at some point between the time I left and the time they got taken over by Wizards of the Coast. Uh, some genius decided that they didn't need to store my original art anymore and they threw it in a dumpster. So I've been doing recreations like this from the non-human chapter of Deities and Demigods, the original yeah. AD&D, Deities and Demigods. And also as stretch goals on those projects, I'm doing new illustrations. I think this is Hrugek, the bugbear god. Uh, the, the, these are drawings of characters that didn't actually have illustrations in, uh, in the original books. Uh, my current project of that kind is a recreation of my very first professionally published work, which was the illustrations in Dragon Magazine number six for the Legions of the Petal Throne Miniatures Painting Guide. Uh, article written by the creator of Empire of the Petal Throne, uh, Professor M. A. R. Barker, and uh, uh, more about Petal Throne stuff in a bit. Um, so uh, after leaving TSR, I worked uh, as a freelancer a number of places. Here's a cover of a Star Wars adventure from West End Games with a cover painting by me. I'm showing the paintings. I actually did way more black and white illustration than. Than, than paintings back in the day. Uh, uh, so uh, that's, uh, that's one of those things. Here's, here's the 1982 edition of Villains and Vigilantes. I'm sorry, yes, 82 edition of Villains and Vigilantes. It was the, uh, it, the original game uh, had some issues and we released a, uh, a uh, second edition, which is much improved. And my co-author on this and I back in, uh, just recently in 2010, we released Villains of Vigilantes 2.1, which is updated with all new artwork uh, and, uh, uh, and does some uh, further cleaned up rules. We're actually, and, and new adventures. And uh, we also are working on a real revamped, um, you know, uh, new millennium third edition of Villains of Vigilantes. Uh, I should read out some links people can go to to find out about this stuff. Um, the uh, the uh, uh, you can find the, our villains of vigilante stuff at Monkey House Games. That's our new company. That's um, www. Uh, excuse me. That's monkeyhousegames.com. That'd be the easy way to find it. Um, and. Uh, Okay, the, um, you'd have to go to Kickstarter and search for my name, Jeff D, and you'll find all the various projects I've worked on there. Uh, here's some more stuff I did. This is a little self-published thing from 87 called Twerps. Luzaki is publishing this line of things now. It was a hmm. kind of tongue-in-cheek, incredibly simplistic role-playing game, uh, in about four pages. 
there's a whole line of adventures for this too that you can get for, from him. Um, in the meanwhile, uh, I also released a second superhero role-playing game called Living Legends, which Monkey House Games is publishing alongside Villains and Vigilantes. This is more of an elaborate uh, point construction system, uh, vaguely like champions, but using all the funny dice. Uh, my other game company, Unigames, published Pocket Universe, is um, a very compact, small uh, uh, universal game system, but not a uh, not tongue in cheek uh, as uh, uh, Twerps was. This is a real role playing game system with like uh, point construction skills and contacts and all kinds of stuff. And the first supplement to that was Teenage Demon Slayers, which is the Buffy the Vampire Slayer without a license supplement, uh, where you make high school kids that fight the forces of darkness. And after that, we followed that up with Quicksilver, which is a complete fantasy role-playing game based on the Pocket Universe system. Uh, the, the gimmick of Quicksilver is that there's this magical material that if you're psychic, you can think at it and cause it to take on any shape that you want. And if you have the right skills, you can take your psychic energy and put it in the items that you've made to give them magical powers. So it's kind of like a universal modeling medium for magic items. Uh, we're currently in the very close to releasing a Pathfinder conversion of the Quicksilver setting. But the thing you brought up, and the, the most recent thing I've done, uh, is this here, Cave Master, also started as a Kickstarter project. The, eh, it's hard to get these things on the screen. It's, uh, it is the cave, uh, it's the role-playing game that cavemen played, is the gimmick. Um, it does not use dice, it uses handfuls of rocks. Um, <laughs> and the character sheet, the character sheet is literally, I think I can show you the, character sheet from in here. No, I can't. The character sheet is literally, ah, there we go. A, video's behind a little bit. It is a picture of an animal skin that you draw. If, if you've got a fire and a burnt stick with like charcoal on the end, you scrawl the things that you need on this piece of animal skin uh, to uh, record your characters. And um, the basic mechanic is, your abilities are represented by stones, which you pick up um, in your two hands and split them secretly so the other guy doesn't know what you've done. So you've got five rocks, right? Well, I might have zero in my left hand and five in my right hand, or I could go two and three or four and one, whoever I want. The other guy doesn't know, and they have to pick a hand. Then the other guy is doing the same thing with the stones representing his character's ability. You each pick one of the other person's hands, reveal how many stones you've got, and uh, that's how pretty much every conflict in the game is resolved. Uh, and it's got a magic system, and it's got stats for dinosaurs for people who want to play a non-historical thing, and it's got science fiction-y stats for alien visitors and time travelers and all those other things uh, for people that want to go there. Uh, that's Cave Master. That's the most recent thing we've done. And it's, um, it's going to be available to your local gaming store by Christmas, so if you go there and tell them that they can get it from Chronicle City, uh, that would be awesome. That is awesome, I do have to say. Um, I'm very interested in that one, just listening to that <laughs> mechanic. I, I am, I am and... running a, an event tomorrow morning right here on, okay. uh, on, uh, on EtherCon. And what time is that going to be at? Um, my notes say uh, 10 a.m. Eastern. Yeah. Okay. That's All right, so everybody, that is uh, going to be 10 a.m. Eastern for Jeff D's game. Um, unfortunately, Table I won't 15. be able to make it. Oh, darn. But Table 15, folks. Definitely. So I do recommend that one. Um, so as far as waiting for questions, um, let's see. Everybody's asking about the rock system here, it looks All like. All right, on fine. Our, uh, chat for <laughs> Start them coming. And that is something that I find peculiar too. Um, what actually 
caused you to come up with that kind of uh, system? Um... Um, I had been thinking of, uh, uh, not exactly along these lines, but just thinking in general of how sad it was on the one hand that role-playing games are still not entirely mainstream. And uh, I happen to have run a Villains and Vigilantes um, session for my regular group where demons were invading from a parallel dimension and they'd gone to the, they fought back and forth for uh, control of this battleground dimension between ours and theirs. And finally, the head demon proposes a final contest for the fate of the earth. And uh, he picked a thing that he thought would be, um, would be fair to earth humans, and it was baseball. We actually played out uh, an inning of baseball with superheroes versus demons. And, uh, and I thought, wow, you know, my dad, who totally did not understand the spaceships and wizards and dragons and medusas and stuff, right? He would totally have enjoyed playing superpowered baseball. It would have, he would have completely understood that. So that was one thing I was thinking was other audiences for role-playing games. But for, uh, on the other hand, I've been bothered by the direction the industry has taken lately where games are coming out in giant $100 bricks full of hardbound books with special dice and special tokens and special sets of cards and all these unique components you have to have. And I'm thinking that is not the way to draw new people into the hobby, right? The the right game to bring in new people will be something that is appealing to a wide audience and does not have a real high entry cost, either in terms of complex mechanics or components. And somehow out of that, it occurred to me to wonder, you know, did, what if we go back to the beginning? What kind of role-playing games could cavemen have played, right? They don't have dice. They, they, components are not an issue because they just don't, ha don't have any. And the rules can't be complicated because they'd have to be passed on verbally from like one tribe's cave master to his apprentice. Uh, and that is, that is where cave master came from. I started, like I picked up a handful of rocks and thought, well, what can I do with these? Uh, and that, that's, that's where it came from. We kicked the idea around a little bit, uh, my partner uh, and I, and, uh, uh, decided that it was worth it. Agonized over the the caveman setting for a while because um, it's it's not immediately obvious to a lot of people why that would be a cool place to to role play. Uh, but um, uh, she put a lot of work into the background stuff, and we convinced ourselves that that we really had something. So we launched it on Kickstarter, and it was a success. Now let's have some questions. And Eric is frozen on my screen. Mm -hmm. So uh, I guess while I'm waiting for the video to catch up, um, uh, the, there's a Cave Master group on Facebook. Uh, search for the Cave Master Space RPG group on Facebook. Okay. All right. There you and, are. Yep. Seems like I had a connection issue here. Sorry about that one. Right. Um, currently, I do have to ask. Uh, I am very looking forward to the uh, cave master. However, um, one thing I do have to ask is uh, just to get it out of the way. Um, what did you think about your experience as a TSR, um, as far as working on demons and demigods and the earlier modules there? Do you have any interesting stories from that time, possibly? It, it was. It was a lot of fun. There were great people there, um, uh, but there developed a, uh, a difference of opinion between a number of the creative people and upper management. 
And so a bunch of us left pretty much the same day. We put on our sunglasses and our leather jackets and we tromped down to, uh, to uh, what do you call it, um, uh, human resources to submit our resignations. I I don't even remember what was the huge deal. I mean, there's just been sort of a growing dissatisfaction and uh, management was aware of the dissatisfaction and they, oh, what they did was they sent around these uh, survey forms. Um, They were were basically job applications to everybody who was already an employee at where you were supposed to say what it was your skill, what your skills were and what you wanted to work on. And they swore up and down, nobody was going to be fired on the basis of their responses to these things, but some people were fired. And that was the thing that caused me and Paul Ritchie and Errol Otis and I think Evan Robinson to tromp down and and quit on that day, which was sad. I mean, I can't say that overall it it was a bad experience, but it was time to move on. Indeed. Um, and thinking about that, uh, as far as the Watsi issue went, how did that, uh, what happened exactly in that circumstance? I still find it hard that they lost your art completely. Oh, well, it transfer. wasn't, it wasn't Watsi's fault. What happened was Watsi acquired TSR and then they, uh, announced that, hey, over here at Watsi, our policy is that original art gets returned to the artists. Hmm. And they they were aware that TSR had these great big um, cabinets full of original artwork. So they they were uh, they were really nice about it. They contacted all the artists and they said, "Send us your contact information, your your mailing address and stuff, and we'll ship you a giant wad of your old artwork," which was awesome. So I sent them my information, and then I waited and I waited and I waited, and nothing happened. I got back to them and they said, we're sorry, but apparently before, at some point before we took over, um, TSR threw out your stuff. Oh. I don't have, I don't have uh, the names of the individuals responsible and I don't, I'm not so vindictive that I would spread that even <laughs> if I did, but uh, apparently at some point it was decided that they needed, uh, they needed room in those filing cabinets for stuff other than my originals. And, and not just me, there's other artists whose stuff got destroyed. Uh, and uh, I hear rumors of a certain amount of dumpster diving that took place. Some of the originals were saved. I know that my painting from the back cover of Q1, I think it was, was saved because I've seen a photo of it uh, that was posted showing it hanging framed on somebody's wall somewhere. Uh, and that's fine. I'm glad that, that some of that stuff got saved. But on my Kickstarter projects, though, I had really have no idea uh, apart from rare instances like that, I have no idea what still exists. My, uh, everything that I've heard is that very little of it does. So I'm just going ahead and recreating everything. And I went ahead and recreated that painting, even though I know that one's still around. Hmm. Okay, very good there. Um, and speaking of that, um, you did bring up the Kickstarter. Um, I yeah. do believe you also have a Deviant Art. Is that correct? Because I yes, have, I have seen... a, I have a Deviant Art page, and all the stuff that I do in my Kickstarter projects goes up there. Also, a lot of contract work that I do goes up there, and a lot of old art that I have lying around from ages past goes up there. Uh, that's jeffd.deviantart.com. Okay, excellent, excellent. And checking our questions here. Let's see, and people are seeming to want to ask about the general art style of Cave Master, um, Uh. just as far as uh, that character sheet looks very awesome. (laughs) So, Uh, I mean, that's probably the easiest character sheet I've ever seen. (laughs) I I didn't do most of the art in Cave Master. I was mostly the game mechanics guy. And my partner at Unigames, Tal Jamir Murr, did... um, uh, pretty much all of the research on Paleolithic life and creatures that were around then and uh, uh, the technologies that they had. And I, my job was to convert all that into uh, game stats for the, the, what we call the Habilis system, 
uh, the gag is that Homo habilis a million years ago came up with the, the role-playing game mechanic with the handfuls of rocks. Uh, but I, I did a couple of things in there, and the, the art varies from, um, you know, a, attempts to make stuff that looks like cave paintings to uh, her illustration style. Let me just pull up something. There's a, here's a, a Terror Bird by Taljimer Murr. She's really good. Uh, she's, um, she's well known as the co-creator of the online game Furcadia. If anybody out there's heard of that, they're running a Kickstarter right now too. They're trying to uh, get Furcadia uh, onto a web-based uh, platform so more people can play. Very good. Now, as far as uh, bringing up that system, is there any specifics you can uh, kind of divulge before it's released, or is that kind of an NDA thing? Wh which, where... which system are we talking about? Uh, Cave Master, as far as it Cave goes. Cave Master uh... is released. Cave Master is, it's, well, it's going to be in stores uh, by Christmas, but you can get it from uh, the PDFs from RPG Now oh, okay. right now. Uh, and uh, also we have books. If you're in a real, real, real hur hurry, you can go to Lulu. The, uh, the Lulu store is www.lulu.com slash spotlight slash UNI underscore games. I wish there was a way for me to share text on here, but uh, uh, that's, I'm afraid that's the best I can do right now. Um, uh, also on... Uh, on RPG Now, you can search for Unigames, U-N-I-G-A-M-E-S, on RPG Now, and you'll find all of our stuff in PDF form. Okay, very good there. Checking for further questions here. Let's see, and uh, we have a general question about uh, what was the main influence, uh, perhaps in your early days, um, any specific novels or uh, stories or just general influences for your artist style and perhaps later on game mechanics? Uh, um, art artistically, it's interesting the question is about, uh, about uh, book influences rather than other artists. But I'll, I'll throw that in too. Um, huge fan of Michael Moorcock. I discovered Elric, uh, Elric novels in the 50 cent rack at my local library. Um, and uh, also read the, uh, the Oz series by L. Frank Baum. A lot of people are not aware. There's actually like 14 books about the land of Oz. Not just the first one that had a movie made out of it. And th those are kind of awesome. Uh, a uh, huge fan of uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs, John Carter of Mars. Um, uh, Carson of Venus was pretty much my introduction to science fiction slash fantasy literature. Uh, that that was great stuff. I uh, when I was a kid, we my parents took us on a vacation to our grandparents' house, and just before we went, uh, oh excuse me, while I was up there, I broke my wrist, my left wrist. And my mom, realizing that I wasn't going to be able to run and jump and play and swim and do all the other things kids could do, uh, took me down to the local, um, uh, like, Walgreens corner store uh, to buy me some stuff to read. And I picked up uh, Carson of Venus because it looked neat. It had a picture of, like, a sea, sea dinosaur thing coming out of the water and menacing this guy in a spaceship. And... Uh, and also an issue of Batman, the, uh, the Batman comic, which happened to be this famous Denny O'Neill, uh, Neil Adams issue with Batman versus Ra uh, Ras al Ghul. That was just the coolest thing I'd ever seen. And that, that, that really, I think, set me on my way. Uh, as far as artistic influences, probably the first one that I'll claim um, that really made a difference to my style was John Byrne and Terry Austin from X-Men back in the day. Not, I, not that my stuff has a lot in common. I mean, some of that, some of the stuff in Deities and Demigods uh, in particular kind of has sort of that influence, but 
my style has wandered around a lot over the years. Um, I went through, um, I went through a uh, Frank Miller phase. Again, not claiming that I, my stuff really looked like him, but where I could feel that I was being influenced. Uh, and uh, more recently, uh, the Hellboy guy. Um, you know who I mean. Uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm trying to remember that guy's name now too, or I can off the top of my head oh, here. I'm, 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 I'm going to stab myself in the head for not knowing that because I absolutely should. Mike Mignola, there. Glad I blurted it out before somebody in the in the audience did. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, and uh, it does look like I do have the immediate follow up question of uh, any music that you'd listen to while uh, perhaps working on art or any music you'd be listening to while working uh, yeah on writing big big. Big uh, new wave fan, uh, Devo, Gary Newman, um, Talking Heads, uh, that kind of stuff. Hugely into that. And the other kind of weird, quirky thing that I like is big band music. Hmm. So, okay. Like, you know, um, huh? Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, uh, so like Benny Goodman and stuff like that. Uh, I say that I really like it, but it's, I don't listen to it all the time. It's just the thing of my, in my musical tastes that stands out as unusual. So I usually mention it. But I do have to say I'm liking your style though with the new wave. So <laughs> I wouldn't be able to live without it. So <laughs> I like I like um, my music to have a little bit of an edge to it. Uh, Elvis Costello. Great example. Big L. There we go. And it's looking like we do have a general question about have you ever uh, met or associated with Gary Gygax? Oh, sure. It looks like. Yeah. Um, when I when I worked there, um, they uh, when I started at TSR, they had just split the company into two different locations. There was the office building in downtown Lake Geneva uh, that was over the Dungeon Hobby Shop. That's where all the creative people were. That's they had the writers, the artists, uh, you know, all that, all the the the, the uh, print production stuff. Uh, and then there was a warehouse just outside of town where they did their manufacturing and, uh, and boxing and shipping and uh, all the business end of things. And um, sad to say, because I don't think he belonged there, uh, Gary was out in the, the business end of things. But there was one point in particular I remember when uh, some miniatures company that had the D&D &D license had just lost it. And they were famous for the pig-faced orcs. If you recall, orcs have gone through a number of different looks uh, over the years. And the, the, the pig snouted orcs, I think invented by Dave Sutherland, uh, were the kinds of orcs that they were selling. And in their wisdom, uh, management decided that they wanted to license a new company to make new miniatures. And one of the things they wanted to do was change the looks of things, of the, at least of the most uh, common things. And orcs were ubiquitous. So the order came down to the art department that we were to come up with a new look for orcs. And, uh, and I did some sketches and I, 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 I dragged him over to Gary's office in the other building for him to review. And um, mine lasted for, I don't know, uh, maybe a year. Uh, my orcs were more ape-like and my goblins were sort of throwback fairy tale rotund bodies with spindly arms and legs kind of kind of goblins and then they changed again hmm. <laughs> oh that's all interesting that's actually i can't say i was ever kind of aware of that information um, uh, nice that guy was probably yeah, around uh, to get directly to the question, Gary Gygax, uh, nice guy. Never had an issue with him myself. OK. 
case anybody cares. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to remember who that was. I believe it was Raul Partha that might have had that uh, license but lost it. Um, I, but then really again, don't. I'd have to. I yeah. I really don't know. Um, actually, here's an interesting question. Um, as far as your own role playing experiences goes, do you have a favorite character that you've ever ran? Or yes, it does seem like a general. Have you ever had a favorite character running a role playing game? Um, there's one character. Well, uh, obviously, my personal villains and vigilantes character, Gauntlet who has appeared in all the different V&V rule books. Okay, not the original one, I guess. Uh, in Villains of Vigilantes, yeah, us, us goofy high school kids decided that the right way to do a superhero game was your character should be you, but with superpowers. And your campaign should be set in like the real world, except that there's superheroes and villains in it. So all of us in the original V&V campaigns were playing characters that were actually us, but we had powers. And my character Gauntlet, which was me, uh, his origin was that he got I got hired to be a uh, like a test pilot for this combat gear, which is completely ridiculous, right? You think about it. What was I seventeen? Uh, yeah, my my part time job is I test these energy weapons, um, but uh, they turned out to be bad guys, and they had hired me because they thought, well, you know. This kid for sure is going to lose when we send our hired villain up against him to steal the technology, see? But it's not really being stolen. That's just our way of getting it to the bad guys, and then they're going to pay us under the table. But I won the fight and uh, and then got to keep the gadgets. So that, that was Gauntlet. I played him for a long, 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 long time, and he's, he's still a major NPC in my superhero campaign. Um, Another one I remember is uh, for a while I ran an, uh, I think it was a D&D &D Rules Cyclopedia campaign. This wasn't all that long ago, maybe 12 years or so. Um, amazing how that's not a lot, a lot, of, lot of time these days. But anyway, uh, I introduced a villain called Tattercloak, who was a, uh, a half-orc assassin that went after my player characters. And... I just liked the concept a lot, so I've used the Tattercloak character both as a hero and as a, a villain and as a hero in various games. I've done superhero versions of him. I've done pirate versions of him. I've done female versions of him. I played Tattercloak as my character on Worlds of Warcraft when I played that for a while. Uh, the basic premise is there's an ancient magical artifact that is this cloak that provides protection and uh, gives you amazing acrobatic abilities and you can glide a little bit and stuff. But it's so ancient that it's, it appears to be falling to pieces. And it's the Tattered Cloak. And the good guy versions of Tattered Cloak are the usually the, the child of a a crime boss who used the cloak and and had the, it used the name tatter cloak and was like a scary underworld figure but then died and the only thing left to the offspring was the cloak and they decide to use it for good not evil so the uh, in fact on my deviant art page you can see one page of a uh of a of a um, electronic comic that I set out to do with him. I only ever got one, the first page of it done. And the technology is really, really, really primitive. I was trying to do this like when, when computers, computer graphics was pretty much limited to about 16 colors. Uh, but, but you can see what, what that was all about. Okay. I'm taking a long oh, time to answer these questions. I hope that's all right. Oh, no, that is perfectly fine. Um, Can I ask how many see. people are, are paying attention to this? Do we have more than two? Oh, my God. It looks like we have at least three. I have several more. Um, it's kind of uh, people jumping in, jumping out uh, of various games, catching this. Yeah. Um, one thing Hi, is everybody. that all these are being... <laughs> yep, indeed. Um, everybody's going to be able to catch these later as well. 
um, uh -huh. via YouTube as well, and when we'll be posting those links for later broadcasts as well. All right, um, that sounds cool. Indeed. Um, next question I do have here seems to be, uh, okay, here we go. Um, people are wondering what your favorite work that you've done has been in the past. Was there any that kind of stood out above the other works you were proud of the most? Um, um, I, I really liked my work on uh, VNV 2.1 my re-illustration of that entire book. Uh, that was a, a lot of fun. I, I actually, <laughs> the, the rule that I decided to operate under when doing the illustrations was uh, I literally made one new illustration uh, of the same size as each of the original uh, revised V&B illustrations, but completely different subject matter and, uh, and different characters. And also we've made a, a big effort this time around to use our established universe characters. Uh, in the olden days, we always looked at V&V &V as kind of a universal superhero game system. And while we had a, a world setting and we'd tell people about it, it there wasn't a focus on that. And we're, we're getting more serious about our setting now. So you'll see uh, major villains from our campaigns that you maybe never even heard of before uh, fighting uh, our, our big heroes. I like that a lot. Um, I don't know. Uh, uh, usually it's whatever I've done most recently that didn't suck <laughs> is my favorite <laughs> stuff. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, next question I do have is actually relating to uh, superheroes and vigilantes. Um, uh -huh. um, they do mention basically... Um, any work in there that you had uh, particularly enjoyed as well, uh, relating specifically to uh, superheroes and vigilantes? Uh, if they mean the role-playing game, villains and vigilantes, yeah, that was what or, I was just talking Villains about. and vigilantes, oh, my, my apologies. There. Um, the, uh, yeah, yeah, like I said, I, I think my favorite stuff I've done recently, apart from... I mean, if I went through with a huge stack of all the work I've done on my on my uh, Kickstarter projects, there are individual pieces there that I'm really, really pleased with. But as a body of work, the thing that I think came out really well was was that. I don't know. It's, it's a little harder for me to get excited about recreating my old TSR stuff. I'm, I'm glad to do it, and I'm glad the people are... are, are, uh, are helping me to make these things exist again um, but really I have the most fun on the stretch goals on those projects where I get to do the new pictures okay um, next question I do have here is uh, in regards to okay um, as far as uh, the cave master game yeah um, that is a weird question. Uh, we'll skip that one. My apologies here. <laughs> Seven. I couldn't even really make that. Okay. It was kind of a gibberish, uh, so blah, blah, blah. Cave Master, and it was like, hmm. Well, to keep things going here, uh, so we do currently have Cave Master, which is out and does have several uh, PDF publications and books and, will be out by Christmas time. Yes, and my current Kickstarter project is uh, I'm recreating the uh, so six or so illustrations that I did for Professor Barker's uh, Legions of the Petal Throne painting guide in Dragon Magazine number six. I am a huge, huge fan of the Empire of the Petal Throne game, which was like this Cadillac of role-playing games that TSR published right after Dungeons & Dragons. It had a, came in a big box set with this spiral-bound white rule book um, illustrated by Professor Barker, who's a, uh, he just passed away earlier this year, but he was a professor of, I always get this not quite right. I, I think the correct term is a professor, professor of South Asian studies 
at the University of Minnesota, and he had been creating his own fantasy uh, setting since he was a kid of about 15, and his par parents bought him a book on Egyptian hieroglyphics. Um, so it's a uh, he it the Empire of the Petal Throne setting, also known as Tecomel, because that's the name of the world in the language of the main empire. Um, is sort of a science fantasy setting. The premise is that you're on an alien planet. It's tens of thousands of years since humans uh, came in their giant spaceships and terraformed the place against the wishes of the uh, of the native inhabitants, and uh, colonized it. And then there was a gigantic disaster that dropped the entire solar system into a pocket dimension, cutting it off from the rest of human space, and uh, and the, the planet itself does not have the proper resources to support advanced technology, so they sank to barbarism. But on the plus side, the physics of the pocket universe in which Tecumel finds itself allow magic. Uh, and it's tens of thousands of years since that disaster, so the the even the idea that you came from another planet and and uh, and that there was technology and stuff is kind of an ancient ancient legends that people barely remember, and the non-humans that you can play in that are not elves, dwarves, and hobbits. They're the other alien races that were part of the uh, the space empire that colonized this place, um, and so they're they're way more interesting and and different and stuff and. The culture is not medieval fantasy. It's more like Babylonian slash Aztec fantasy. Mm. Uh, the god and uh, the gods are these extra-dimensional entities that entities that now can show up and screw with people. It's just, uh, it's it's awesome, uh, and I've loved this <laughs> since the olden days when my when I was still a kid in high school and my brother went away to college, taking all the D and D stuff with him and leaving only Empire of the Petal Throne. In fact. The very first superhero battle that Jack Herman and I played out when we had had the idea of doing a superhero game used the Empire of the Petal Throne game mechanics. Only we built Spider-Man and the Human Torch and just you know made up rules for the flame powers and the webs. And after having made up those uh, those rules, we thought you know if we just kept going and made up rules for everything, we'd have a superhero game. Uh, I went on this subject. Oh. So the other thing I haven't mentioned yet is I've gotten permission from the Tecumel Foundation, which is the organization that is now in charge of the rights to Professor Barker's setting, to do a new role-playing game, which is going to be called Bethorm, which is the Tsoyani uh, word for a pocket dimension. It's like, uh, it's going to be Bethorm, the plane of Tecumel. And it's got a website, bethorm.com, where, uh, where we'll be talking all about this. We're still got like one tiny little round of negotiations on the contract with the Tecumel Foundation. And uh, in the meanwhile, this Tecumel artwork that I'm doing in my Kickstarter project is going to grace the pages of the Baythorn rulebook as illustrations when that comes out. So I'm, I'm very, very excited about that. It's another thing from my early days in gaming that, uh, that I get to revisit, which is awesome. I see. And that was actually what I was just about to ask there yeah. in regards to any uh, kind of things down the pipeline. So that's awesome. There's also uh, a third edition of Villains and Vigilantes in the works. 2.1 that came out in 2010 was just like a cleanup of the old game and making it widely available again. Uh, but we're working on 3.0. Okay. Sounds good there. Uh, next question I do have is actually an interesting one. Do you have a active interest in anthropology um, as far as could, uh, going along with the cave master theme? Was there extensive research done in that field or um, how truthful were you going for a accurate feel? Um, uh, this was, this was Talajamir's call and, uh, and her decision was, and I fully support this, I think it was the right one. Uh, was that since the information about the people and their lives back in those days are prehistoric, we don't have a lot of extensive records, we've just got uh, archaeological reconstructions. So uh, we gave ourselves the freedom to uh, deviate from actual history 
by not precisely having Cro-Magnons and Neanderthals. And we made up a couple of other, uh, we, we have, instead of Cro-Magnons, we have the, uh, the Yorwa, who are essentially modern humans, but, um, but living in that period. And the Rogak, who are kind of like Neanderthals. And then two made up races, the Mahichi, who uh, still have their fur and tails and live in trees. And also the Tanui, who are kind of a Tuatha de Danan precursor elf caveman kind of guys that live along the shore and have slightly pointy ears and a completely different culture. Uh, so, so we deviated in that regard just because we knew if we tried to be absolutely accurate historically in you know, every year new discoveries are going to come out. They're going to make us more and more wrong. So this way we're, we've covered our asses. On the other hand, uh, she put a huge amount of effort into researching the technologies that were available that we knew that they were using at those times. And we put that all in the game. Uh, and like I said, we, it, we have covered all the creatures that actually existed during that time, but also threw in the dinosaurs for people who want that or, the time travelers for people who want that and the alien visitors for people that want that. Uh, and the, you know, the, the, uh, the spirit magic for people who want that me, when I run cave master, it's the kitchen sink, right? I mean, everything is there. I, I, nothing to me is more fun than a bunch of cavemen trying to pilot their captured alien spacecraft and, and, and destroy a herd of tyrannosaurs. That's how I like to play it. But if anybody that wants to play a more realistic game will not have any trouble. Oh, very excellent there. Actually, that sounds like something I'd like to do too here. <laughs> <laughs> well, it doesn't start that way. I mean, the, the premise of the game is actually, you know, you're supposed to be inventing anything that's going to be advanced technology that you come up with, right? But, um, uh, and so there's there's a complete rule a uh, rule set in there for oh i've come up with this idea of a new way the new thing we can do well all right you, know, you do your test of stones what's your character's skills that are relevant and and all that and are you successful and how much time does it take and how many of these things can you actually make so you know but according to that system you should be eventually be winding up with um you know rubber band powered shot throwers and uh ornithopters with made from animal skins and stuff uh, but the, the, the science fiction, the elements are in there too for those people that want to go there. Okay. And I do have uh, another question coming in. Um, one stating uh, as far as uh, all various influences considered, um, are you more a fan of science fiction or more superhero S stories or of fantasy? Uh, the reason I love superheroes is because it's anything goes. A superhero, and th that's why superhero games are hard to, to design, uh, because they have to be able to do everything. And, uh, and I like that. I just, I, um, it, I'd like to bash as many different genres together as I possibly can. That's overstating it a bit, but <laughs> yeah, I, I'll, I love me some superheroes, um, when I read science fiction, I generally want it to be hard science, science fiction, because I find that more impressive. Um, uh, and, uh, but I can enjoy a good science fantasy too. I just don't take it as seriously. Um, and uh, I'm a huge fan of, uh, of the uh, Song of Ice and Fire series from George R.R. R. Martin. I was reading those books years ago uh, when a, a, a game master that I was playing under told me, hey, these are, these are really awesome. That's right. That th those books inspired me to run some of the best fantasy RPG sessions that I ever ran. All right. Excellent there. Um, I do have one random question coming in about have you uh, played D&D uh, &D since uh, your time at TSR, or have you drifted to your own projects and maybe other different varying game systems? Uh, I'll I'll play just about anything, but when I run stuff, I generally am running my own things. Um, and it, uh, it's 
it, it's a little unfortunate because I'm uh, even if I'm satisfied with uh, with somebody else's system, my players generally aren't because I've trained them up to be used to the assumptions of my of my game mechanics. Uh, so I, I recently uh, tried to do a I think second edition uh, Warhammer uh, RPG campaign, and that got in about two sessions before my players started complaining and I had to switch it over to Pocket Universe. Um, I, I have a soft spot in my heart for the uh, Chaosium basic role-playing system. That's one of the first early games that really impressed me, specifically on the question of Dungeons & Dragons. Um, I, I don't go out of my way to play D&D anymore, but I'll play it if that's what's being run. Um, I uh, absolutely nothing against the creators of D and D, but um, I think that the technology of uh, the, and the the philosophy of game design has moved on, and I prefer games that uh, that take a slightly different, um, more advanced approach. And uh, my, uh, I think I I was telling somebody somewhere recently what I look for in a good game system is I want it to do as much work for the GM as possible in terms of having rules that make sense that cover the kinds of things that you're always having to deal with in, as a game as a game master in a role-playing game but I want that set of rules to be as small and compact as possible so um, uh, lately that's that's been my design philosophy ever since pocket universe that is been where I'm I'm trying to go with my designs, and the Habla system is kind of overkill <laughs> on that particular <laughs> angle, but it works. We've we've played a number of different games with the Habla system, by the way. Um, uh, we did we did a couple episodes of a Star Trek game where uh, it was uh, the, the, the we used glass beads that we called dilithium crystals instead of rocks for their abilities. Uh, we've talked about like a gun fu Hong Kong action game with bullets in your hands, handfuls of bullets. But we haven't actually tried that yet. I imagine it would work. I mean, you could do a gardening game and it could be dried peas. It doesn't, anything that can be small objects you hold in your hand. Okay. And, okay, Hong Kong bullets. I Okay, I want you to make this. Fistful, <laughs> fistful of bullets will be the name of that game. <laughs> Okay. Um, it does seem like we have one last question here. Um, generally, how do you think the uh, feel of the RPG industry is going to go in the next few years? Um, are we going to keep advancing with uh, more outbranching RPG mechanics, or are, is the retro clone movement of uh, trying to get back to that earlier first and second edition D&D &D going to push us back to that style of play again? What I, what I keep wanting to see, and I've seen a little hints of it here and there uh, from the retro clones, is you know, rewinding back to that point and then making some fundamental improvements to the approach. Uh, and um, uh, I've, I've seen a little bit of that, but I have yet to see the retro clone that you know, it just sort of has a D and D veneer to it, but the, under the hood, it is a uh, more solid set of mechanics. When, when I say that, I mean obviously you can play D and D and have a perfect good time. Nothing wrong with that. Uh, but as a designer, right, and as a game mechanics geek, uh, I am looking for um, better tuned, faster, slicker, you know, better engineered mechanics than. Uh, than you get by just turning back the clock to D&D. &D. Okay. Sounds well, where good. the industry is going, I, I keep yeah. sort of going off on a tangent and not directly answering the question. Uh, no worries there. Um, uh, I have no idea. Um, I would sure... I, don't, I think the cat's out of the bag as far as new game systems. Um, and I think that the... Uh, I think the time of the dominance of the D20 system is over. Um, but uh, uh, 
uh, how, exactly how things are going to go from there. I think I think we're going to continue to balkanize, and there's going to be more and more and more different systems. And I hope that eventually, out of that, something rises to the top in place of D20. Uh, that is just a um, a, uh, a cleaner, easier to learn, easier to run um, set of rules that will make it easier for people to come into the hobby. That's that's my big concern. All right, and sounds good. Um, currently, it does appear that we are out of time, so I would like to thank you for coming and being a part of our AetherCon this year. And it's been fun. Thanks for having me. And thanks definitely. everybody who 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 stuck it out and uh, and even people that stepped through for a moment to hear me rant. Indeed. And as always, this uh, conversation will be posted up uh, for later broadcast via our main webpage, aethercon.com. And uh, we will continue streaming throughout the day. So hopefully we might have this uh, conversation up by then. Cool. And, and if you're uh, if you're on Facebook, friend me on Facebook, everybody. Will do. I think that might be my next course of action here. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Jeff. It was a good time. Thanks. I enjoyed it. All right.